Hi, and welcome to Thinking About Science again. And this is the final lecture in the series. Uh, this lecture is on science and bioethics, so we should get started. So, in this lecture, we're going to address science from a different dimension. We're going to be looking at science and at bioethics, and in particular at the question of whether the kinds of limits bioethics impose on science should be part of a definition of, of what science is. So, normativity, normativity is uh, probably a good starting point here. So it's relevant to science in a number of ways, but it will be useful to start with a definition. Now, norms are standards that are supposed to function as guidelines regarding conduct or behaviour. Normativity is the property possessed by these standards, in virtue of which they are held to be apt guides to our conduct or behaviour. Uh, norms are generally function by imposing limitations of some kind, and that are inherently prescriptive. Uh, they say what is not allowed or proscribed. Now, norms can also be prescriptive. Uh, they can act as recommendations within the realm of what is allowed or permitted. Um, three kinds of normativity seem re relevant to science. So there's epistemic normativity, methodological and ethical. And in each case, the relevant norms are best understood proscriptively as limiting science in various ways or along various dimensions. Now, we should attend to each of these in turn uh, with examples to illustrate. So, epistemic normativity prescribes certain kinds of epistemological claims or access to certain kinds of epistemological status for claims. As an example, uh, we can take the argument uh, presented by Cardinal Bellarmine against Galileo's claim that the Copernican heliocentric sy system uh, constituted new knowledge. For the Copernican theory to be knowledge, it needed to satisfy at least three requirements. And these are usually characterised as the Justified True Belief, or JTB theory of knowledge, which has at least these three requirements. One, it had to be believed. Two, it had to be true. And three, it needed to be adequate, have adequate just, they needed to, sorry, there needed to be adequate justification for believing it to be true. Now, with regard to one, the theory was believed at least by its supporters. And with regard to two, matters were still to be settled, but they would have been a lot closer to being settled if it could be shown that three was satisfied. That is, that there was adequate justification for believing uh, the heliocentric system to be true. Uh, the debate between Bellarmine and Galileo was therefore over three. Now, according to Galileo, there was adequate um, justification for believing um, the Copernican heliocentrism was true. However, Galileo did not clearly distinguish the various grounds for thinking the heliocentric hypothesis was true. His telescopic observations were contingent, and the only mathematical proofs he appealed to were only sorry only the mathematical mathematical proofs he appealed to were necessary. According to Bellarmine, the hypothesis of Copernican heliocentrism did not satisfy an ad adequacy requirement for justification. In Bellarmine's view, knowledge requires a priori justification that has only two sources, revelation and necessary demonstration. Now, Galileo did not claim to have witnessed revelations, and the justifications he offered fell short of solely being necessary demonstrations. So, Copernican heliocentrism, according to Bellarmine, could not constitute new knowledge. Now, here we see Bellarmine imposing an epistemic norm. Epistemic justification must be a priori and can only have one of two sources, revelation or necessary demonstration. This is a prescription or limitation on access to an epistemic status of being knowledge. Note that Bellarmine was in a position to do this because the church had previously claimed power over others as an epistemic authority. And epistemic normativity and these kinds of power relations are often closely connected. And we should talk a bit about methodological normativity. Methodological normativity prescribes the categorization of certain investigations as scientific on the grounds that they do not fulfill certain methodological standards. The most obvious example of this in thinking about science is the use by Popper of falsification as a demarcation criteria for what counts as being part of science and what does not. According to Popper, investigations that uh, involved propounding theories or hypotheses that could not be falsified should not count as science because they do not fulfill the methodological requirement of being answerable to the empirical evidence. 
Uh, as an example, take the hypothesis that in humans, gender roles are not natural, but are culturally constructed. Now, as Kitcher points out, the best attempt at a falsification so far, the so-called kibbutz experiment, does not provide a clear falsification of the hypothesis. Uh, more importantly, since the whole idea of a gender role is a cultural one, it's not clear what could count as a falsification of the hypothesis. According to Popper, the hypothesis that in humans gender roles are not natural would therefore fail to count as scientific as it fails in principle to fulfill the methodological standards required. So it would be incorrect to claim that, propounding that hypothesis, in propounding that hypothesis, you are propounding a scientific hypothesis, and incorrect for others to treat it as a scientific hypothesis. Now, we have ethical normativity as well. Ethical normativity prescribes doing science in certain ways. Certain kinds of research are not to be performed as part of science. This prescription is of a different kind to the foregoing two. Uh, it is not based around the correctness or incorrectness of certain kinds of conduct or behaviour, but rather around the acceptability or unacceptability of certain kinds of conduct or behaviour. However, this is still a prescription on what counts as science research uh, that is deemed to be unethical. Uh, so science uh, research that is deemed to be unethical is usually deemed to be bad science even if it fulfills methodological criteria for being science, and even if it is accepted as yielding knowledge. Uh, as an example, take the famous Tuskegee experiment in which the effects of syphilis were studied. Now, the study gathered its data by leaving black males in the American South untreated and periodically testing them. The study did gather uh, reliable data, and after a fashion, its hypothesis that left untreated syphilis spreads in a community could, after a fashion, be falsifiable. Further, the claim that the experiment yielded knowledge seems to also stand up to scrutiny. However, the experiment would still be deemed bad science. That is science that should not be done. And in some cases, there might be reason for thinking that it is not acceptable to use the data gathered from the experiment. Uh, for some time, uh, similar considerations led many to question whether or not the data obtained by experiments on hypothermia done by Nazi scientists on Jewish prisoners uh, um, was in the same category. And this is until the Nazi experiments were shown to be methodologically unsound and the data obtained from them to be largely fraudulent. This is ethical prescription, uh, so this ethical prescription is operating in a different way, along a different dimension, but it still is just as much a prescription prescription as the other one to, oh, sorry, we had looked at. Moreover, like the other two prescriptions, it applies to conduct or behaviour. The question is, what difference do these differences make? So ethics can enter into scientific research in two ways. One, regarding the researcher, um, researcher ethics, and two, regarding the ethics of the research project. Now, from the point of view of what science uh, of what science is, failure of researcher ethics takes priority. If purported scientific research fails in this regard, then it fails to be science at all. Uh, on the other hand, if a failure with regard to the ethics of research projects does not, in and of itself, undermine the claim that the research is still scientific. So, in the case of researcher ethics, the issue is whether or not the researcher has conducted their research with an appropriate amount of rigour and whether or not they are honest about the results of their research. Uh, researchers fail to be ethical in this regard if their research is poorly conducted or if they produce fraudulent results. Uh, in effect, they are not playing the game of science according to the rules. Uh, they are being dishonest. So Nazi hypothermia research would be a good example here. Researchers who are unethical in this way are in effect breaking an implicit promise made to other members of the scientific community and wider society. They're also undermining science itself and given the importance of scientific findings for areas like medicine, they're also acting unethically in this regard. Now, in the case of the ethics of research projects, um, we, uh, the issue is whether or not the way in which the research project is implemented violates certain broader ethical norms that are supposed to prescribe certain sorts of conduct or behaviour.
So implementation of research projects that fails to be ethical in this regard, uh, if it involves something like the violations of individuals' rights or the creation of unnecessary suffering to obtain research results. Uh, the Tuskegee experiment would be a good example here. Now, however, implementation of a research project that is unethical in this way is not a matter of failing to play the game of science according to the rules. Uh, at least not any rules relating to scientific methodology. And this kind of research would only seem to undermine science itself to the extent that it might dissuade further participation by members of society or of the public at large in future research. So it seems unproblematic to suppose um, in the first sense ethics plays a role in defining what counts as scientific. But what about the second sense? Should we say that, re that research deemed unethical in the second sense is not really science at all? We should note something about the implementations of research projects that are deemed to be unethical, like the Tuskegee experiment. The unethical nature of the research stems from the fact that the research is conducted on living beings, biota of some sort. In fact, uh, the issues raised by it are relevant to research on just about any living being capable of having interests or suffering, from chimpanzees through to mice and perhaps even further down. If the implementation of a research project does not involve living beings, then it cannot be unethical in this sense. So a minimum requirement is that the research project deals with living beings in the same way, or in some way, sorry, or with information pertaining to them, such as genetic information. Now, bioethics is the discipline that deals with the ethics of the implementation of research projects. It seeks to answer questions about the ethical acceptability of such implementation and to establish what kinds of implementations of research projects should be proscribed through justification and argumentation. However, um, unlike other areas of ethics, bioethics involves a significant amount of uh, casuistry, that is, attention to specific details of particular cases. So when bioethicists examine the Tuskegee experiment, they look at the specific features of the case to come to conclusions about whether it is good or bad science, whether or not implementation of the experiment involves doing morally wrong things. Uh, when other ethicists uh, in, uh, examine the Tuskegee experiment, if they do, uh, they're more likely to look at whether our intuitions about the experiment agree with particular principles of a philosophical outlook, such as the principle that suffering should be minimised or that rights should always be upheld. Now, so we can def refine our earlier question. Should we say that implementations of research projects involving living beings for that, uh, that, for example, violate individual rights or cause unnecessary suffering, uh, should not be counted as part of science. Um, this question is different from our original one, but it still addresses the same general concern. Should bioethical considerations determine what counts as science? So, suppose we say no. What grounds might we have for doing so? We can point to the fact that the role being played by normativity in science in the case of bioethics is significantly different to the role played by normativity in other areas of science. So in the case of epistemic normativity, we are attempting a kind of regulation that will allow us to distinguish reliable information from unreliable information. And um, uh, we do this by regulating which claims can count as knowledge. In the case of methodological normativity, we're attempting a kind of regulation of the practice of science that preserves appropriate levels of rigour and allows us to demarcate the kind of knowledge gotten through science from knowledge gotten in other ways. Um, the case of the ethics of researchers, uh, we, in that case, we're attempting to regulate the conduct of researchers so that methodological normativity is not undermined. Um, note that these conditions stack up. If a researcher's conduct is unethical, say dishonest, then this undermines the methodological rigour, and this in turn undermines any claim that their findings might make to being knowledge. And of course it works back the other way. Unprofessional conduct leads to non-rigorous findings, which then will undermine uh, the idea that what's involved here is knowledge.
Now, all of these forms of normativity involve regulation relating to the ends of scientific research. Uh, that is, we regulate to ensure these ends are achieved. However, in the case of ethical normativity, we're attempting to regulation relating to the means by which re scientific research uh, achieves its ends. This is what makes the crucial difference. And we can draw on in a parallel to illustrate the difference. So regarding contentious hypotheses in areas like evolutionary science that might have significant political consequences for, say, gender roles, Philip Kitcher says everybody ought to aim uh, to agree, sorry, that given sufficient evidence for some hypothesis about humans, we should accept that hypothesis, whatever its political consequences. That's from his book, Vaulting Ambition. This position is parallel to a refusal to allow bioethical considerations to determine what counts as science. Uh, if the evidence for a hypothesis is sufficient, we should accept it, regardless of the political consequences. If the implementation of a research project fulfills the requisite ends related norms, then we should allow it, albeit under very strict conditions. So the Tuskegee experiment should still count as part of science. Note that these two are not the same thing, but they are parallel. So it's a parallel between these two cases, one to do with politics and values attached to it, and one to do with ethics and values attached to that. Now suppose we say yes, uh, what grounds might we have for doing so? So that is that we say yes, that bioethical considerations should limit what counts as science. So we can point to the fact that answering no involves a kind of implicit presumption that could turn out to be hard to justify. In answering no, uh, we're supposing that a form of objectivity is possible in science, that we could, under ideal conditions, be sure our knowledge claims are sound, our methodological rules will lead to successful research, and researcher honesty and rigour do genuinely matter. Now, all of these suppositions involve a commitment to scientific realism. Uh, knowledge claims need to be true. Methodological rules only lead to successful research if that research is hitting on reality. And researcher honesty only really matters if more than obtaining correct predictions is important to us. Suppose, however, that we're not convinced of scientific realism. Then it seems we might think that we need to be more cautious. We might suppose that science as a whole is only a tool for doing useful, for obtaining useful results like correct predictions. If science is a tool for obtaining useful results, then it might matter how we use that tool to obtain those results. In other words, scientific research involves no ends in themselves, it is just a means to other ends like the improvement of the human condition with its relevant end. Um, and how the means achieve that ends matters. Uh, this view of science is as incapable of absolute objectivity is similar, though not exactly the same as, Longinot's view that a value-free science is impossible. On Longinot's view, values are and should be part of the very foundations of science, but we should be honest about our values. On the view that says that yes to bioethical considerations, are determining what counts as science. Bioethical considerations help to ensure that important values are part of the foundations of scientific science from the get-go. Okay, so we should round up and finish for today for this last lecture. So I started with a definition of normativity and then I went on to talk a little bit about various forms of normativity, uh, epistemic normativity, regulating what counts as knowledge claims, methodological normativity, regulating uh, the way in which we go about doing scientific research. Then I talked a little bit about ethical normativity and identified two ways in which ethical normativity could play a role in science. One is in the form of researcher ethics, about the conduct of researchers and uh, avoiding fraud them making fraudulent claims um, or falsifying their research. And then the other is research project ethics, which is about the ethics governing the kinds of research projects and whether projects of certain kinds should be carried out. Uh, we then talked a little bit about bioethics, and I uh, gave us a, a sort of a very basic account of what's involved in bioethics as a form of um, re uh, uh, investigation, and then raised the question of whether or not bioethical research, or bioethics itself, sorry, should be part of determining what counts as science. And we very briefly explored the case for yes and the case for no. Uh, of course, if you want to know more about bioethics, there are many units on offer that you can study for that. Alright, for now, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you later.